Are there any drugs which themselves lead to Parkinson? And then you would start calling it drug-induced Parkinson. Yes, there are those drugs who are going to block the dopaminergic receptors or those who are going to decrease the dopaminergic transmission are going to lead to drug-induced Parkinson. Here's a slide here. Have a look. In the first place, you have antipsychotic agents, haloperidol and dropidol, which are butyrophenols. In the second place, you also have antipsychotic agents once again, and these are phenothiazines in the form of chlorpromazine. In the third place, you have dopaminergic blockers or dopaminergic antagonists, and these agents are anti-emetic agents. That's metoclopramide and domperidone. In the next place, you have central alpha-2 agonist. I would like to remind you of this alpha-2 receptor in the central nervous system, which is a presynaptic receptor and it's an inhibitory receptor. We spoke about this on the autonomic nervous system. So these are central alpha-2 agonists. Usually these drugs are used in the management of hypertension, but they can lead to the Parkinson-like symptoms. These are alpha methyl dopa and clonidine. There are two more groups of antihypertensive agents which deplete the catecholamine is reserpine and which is an adrenergic neuron blocker is guanathidine. These drugs also can lead to decrease in the dopamine and can induce Parkinson. So it will be useful for you to remember all the drugs together as they are shown on this slide which can lead to the drug induced Parkinson disease. There are some atypical antipsychotic agents are less likely to produce but yes, they have got the potential to produce drug-induced Parkinson or drug-induced involuntary movement. The next important neurotransmitter in the central nervous system is 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is a tryptophan derivative. 5-hydroxytryptamine has been studied much, much extensively over a period of last 20 years. And the knowledge about the functions of 5-HT has produced a kind of revolution in the management of many psychiatric disorders. Is the dorsal raphe nucleus, that is the upper pons and lower midbrain, the important area for 5 hydroxytryptamine, and it's involved in the modulation of mood, sleep, pain, appetite, sexuality, as well as the impulse control. Let's understand what happens if there is more serotonin, that's more 5 HT, increased level of 5 HT. When there's increased level of 5 HT, it's an amine like dopamine. So it's going to produce positive effects just as we discussed with dopamine. There will be improved mood, there will be improved sleep and there are likely to be psychotic symptoms if the 5-HT is in too much of excess. There are some negative effects of increased 5-HT and one of the important ones includes delayed orgasm leading to anorgasmia and a sexual dysfunction. Those drugs which are going to increase the 5-HT are going to lead to anorgasmia or the delayed orgasm. And such drugs are SSRI, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and the TCAs, the tricyclic antidepressant agents. Look at this, all the antidepressant agents are going to act by increasing the amines and one of the important amines is 5 hydroxytryptamine. So if they are increasing the amines and they are going to lead to better mood, they are going to improve the mood of the patient. At the same time, the increase in the 5-HT level can also lead to delayed orgasm and a sexual dysfunction called anorgasmia. So these are important effects of increase in the 5-hydroxytryptamine. Now we go to what would happen if 5-hydroxytryptamine levels are less. If 5-HT levels are less, obviously the patient is going to get mental depression or the depression of the mood. And one important thing associated with decreased 5-HT levels is very poor impulse control. And when the impulse control is poor, patient becomes the person becomes impulsive. He may go to commit an act which is unusual, which is abnormal. For example, like a suicide, like a murder, is likely to be due to the loss of the impulse. The person loses the impulse, becomes impatient, and this happens due to the decreased 5-HT levels in the brain. This person can exhibit violent behavior 
so also this decreased fire ht is coming playing its role in many other conditions namely alcoholism is associated with decreased fire ht many chronic pain syndromes and the neurogenic pains and the neuropathic pains are associated with decreased fire ht some sleep disorders and most importantly the anxiety states or anxiety disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder is known to be associated with decreased fire ht and if you go to discuss the management of anxiety disorders many times ssri are used who are going to increase the 5 ht levels so i'm speaking about the tca the tricyclic antidepressants ssri shown on this slide selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and ssnri selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors all of them they inhibit the reuptake of 5 ht inside the terminal and this is why 5 ht will become more at the receptor site and this is useful to treat mental depression this is useful to treat anxiety states and this is useful in the management of many neuropathic pain syndromes the next neurotransmitter is a quaternary amine and that's acetylcholine if there's loss of cholinergic neurons or there's decrease in the acetylcholine levels due to decrease in the choline acetyl transferase required for the acetylcholine synthesis then you are likely to get a disease called alzheimer rather to put it in a better way in alzheimer disease there is an associated loss of cholinergic neurons or there is decreased acetylcholine levels this leads to the symptom of dementia and the area most commonly affected is the hippocampus other conditions associated with this could be down syndrome various movement disorders and sleep disorders because acetylcholine is less or the cholinergic transmission is less we try to pour in acetylcholine by giving anticholinesterases drugs anticholinesterases agents and they are going to inhibit the breakdown of existing acetylcholine and are going to potentiate the effects of already existing acetylcholine the names of the drugs i hope you remember from your autonomic knowledge donepezil rivastigmine and galanthamine next we move on to histamine when you think of histamine you always think of the common cold the, the stuffy nose and all this but histamine works an important neurotransmitter in the brain histamine is also called ethylamine and histamine is associated with sedation sleep mood and appetite if you block the histaminergic receptors that's the h1 receptor in the brain as it is blocked by many psychopharmacological agents the what the patient gets is sedation i don't know if you ever took a sedating antihistamine agent like chlorpheniramine to give you an example it may be avil or it may be piritone for example this is an older sedative antihistamine blocks h1 receptors by crossing the blood brain barrier going inside the brain and then i hope you realize if you took this chlorpheniramine any time obviously it would produce sedation and it would produce drowsiness i hope this example will help you to remember when you block h1 receptors you get sedation increase sleep if the h1 blocking agents or the drugs which can block h1 receptors are given for a pretty long period of time they can lead to one more effect and this effect is increase in the appetite and this patient starts eating more and because he starts eating more as compared to what is lost the patient starts getting weight gain so increase appetite and weight gain are classical symptoms of the histaminergic blocker of course this can be also produced by the blocker of dopaminergic receptors and by the blocker of the serotonin 5 hd receptors but histamine is on the top list so h1 blocker means sedation sleep increased appetite and weight gain the traditional antipsychotic agents like chlorpromazine haloperidol do have this particular adverse effect also some of the non traditional that's the atypical antipsychotics also exhibit sedation increased appetite and weight gain as well as some antidepressant drugs like the tricyclics and some ssri do produce sedation sleep increased appetite and weight gain now we come to the muscarinic receptors in the central nervous system 
the muscarinic receptor is concerned with behavior and when the muscarinic receptors are blocked it leads to adverse effects of many psychoactive agents so what you are what we are doing on this module is we are preparing our firm base to learn the psychopharmacology to learn the neuropharmacology and the various agents which are going to produce adverse reactions i was speaking about the adverse effects of psychoactive agents and they block the muscarinic receptors muscarinic blockade is known to happen by antipsychotic agents as well as the tricyclic antidepressant agents and when muscarinic receptors are blocked is nothing but the action of atropine atropine like effect and you could imagine in your mind what are the adverse effects of atropine are going to be the same adverse effects for traditional antipsychotic agents and for the tricyclic antidepressants they are here for you on the slide blurriness of vision photophobia precipitation of glaucoma if the patient already suffers from glaucoma that's the raised intraocular tension retention of urine or urinary hesitancy dryness of mouth dryness of secretions and constipation these are going to be the very common adverse effects if you go and block the muscarinic receptors so we talked about the neurotransmitters we talked about the receptors we need to know what are the metabolites of this neurotransmitter have a look at the slide number 1 nor epinephrine ne gets broken down into mhpg that's 3 methoxy 4 hydroxy phenylglycol another metabolite of nor epinephrine as well as epinephrine is vma that's vanillyl mandelic acid if mhpg levels and vma levels are more is telling you that the nor epinephrine epinephrine are more and this could be a diagnostic diagnostic test for a disease called pheochromocytoma which is a tumor of adrenal medulla and secreting intermittently epinephrine and noradrenaline the second substance is dopamine and the end product of dopamine is hva that's homo vanillic acid the third important neurotransmitter we discussed was 5 hydroxy tryptamine or serotonin what's the name of the metabolite of 5 ht is called 5 hiaa that's 5 hydroxy indole acetic acid so if there is going to be more 5 ht in your body there is going to be more excretion of 5 hydroxy indole acetic acid and i would like to give you an example of carcinoid tumors which are known to secrete 5 hydroxy tryptamine so if a patient has carcinoid tumor you expect his 5 hia levels to be high or to go to the other way round if you think of the patients who committed suicide who went into the impulsive behavior and when autopsies were done and their brains were studied it was found that the 5 hydroxy tryptamine levels were too less so if you go in, inside someone's body and try to estimate what's the amount of 5 hiaa that's getting excreted if the 5 hiaa level is less it would mean that the 5 ht level is less keep this in mind whenever you try to become impulsive whenever you get anger for someone try to calm down whenever you getting angry or you getting impulsive it means your 5 hydroxy tryptamine level is decreasing next we go on to see what happens in depression what happens in mania and what happens in psychosis you have a slide in front of you in depression there's decreased levels of norepinephrine 5ht and dopamine you all said this and the metabolites which will be decreased will be mhpg for norepinephrine and hpa for dopamine the area getting affected most probably will be left free prefrontal cortex and the limbic system the next condition is mania that's the high mood there will be there is likely to be increased dopamine level so hva will be higher and this is concerned with the right prefrontal cortex and the limbic system coming to the third row is about psychosis and we already said if there's psychotic symptom it means the amines are increasing so there's increased dopamine there's increased 5 hydroxytryptamine leading to more levels of hva and more levels of 5 hiaa and also 
increased level of glutamate. This, the affection in this condition is the, in the bilateral prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. The next slide is about anxiety and dementia. Anxiety is a state with hyperactivity, with fear, with phobia and therefore there is decrease in an inhibitory neurotransmitter that's your GABA and there is decrease in the 5 HD levels that's 5 HIA whereas norepinephrine or its metabolite MHPG may be increased. The area most commonly thought to be involved is the locus cereulius and the right parahippocampal gyrus. Lastly, in dementia, we already discussed this, just reviewing, there could be decreased acetylcholine and there could be increased glutamate. The important area to be thought of is hippocampus and the nucleus bacillus of Maynard. We already started talking about the feeling, about the sensation and the disorders which are associated with the feeling are called psychological disorders or behavioral disorders and mostly they are based on the amine dysfunction or amine imbalance in the limbic system. Look at the slide. It's telling you about four important components of psychopharmacology. The first box is describing what happens if the amines are more. And I've written three names, dopamine, norepinephrine, 5-hydroxytryptamine. If the amine level is high, is going to lead to psychosis and one of the examples of this psychosis is schizophrenia. Go to the opposite side, exactly opposite. If the amines are less, that's norepinephrine, dopamine or 5-HT, then it's going to lead to depression. I hope you would keep this in mind. Schizophrenia, psychotic state, aggression means increased amines and depressive mood and lack of self-confidence means decreased in the amines. There is one more disorder called bipolar disorder. In bipolar disorder, you have cycles of mania and depression. And the last disorder is the various anxiety states, which are previously called as neurosis. So we've gone through the psychopharmacological issues and we know exactly what are going to be the disorders and what's the basis of this particular disorder. It's better if you go through this particular module again and again and try to listen to it and try to look at the slides. It's going to fi fix up the ideas in your mind while you are going to learn the central nervous system pharmacology in reality. I hope you enjoyed. It's going to help you. Best of luck. Thank you.